I've asked Nat to go a long introduction, so I'm going to do away with that. Our first talker is going to be uh, Louise Jazerski, who is a professor of uh, social relations in James Madison College. Hi, and I uh, teach theory to sophomores, and I'm a, I apologize for my really wonky <laughs> slides. We just looked at these nice pictures of, you know, Jane Jacobs' public spaces. I'm an urban and community sociologist. But I teach social policy and um, writ large. And I actually teach a course called The Uses and Pleasures of Theory. So when I'm trying to teach my students um, from texts, texts that were originally written in German, we take pleasure in reading not large texts. So I'm sorry if that doesn't translate to this kind of classroom. <laughs> so I'm just really embarrassed by my really sort of walking side. But I'm going to tell stories. And I want to start with a story. <laughs> that I was looking up in a political philosophy journal about George Washington's rules of decent behavior. And I thought it was too impolite to actually put on a slide, because George Washington made this long list of things that you shouldn't do, including things like spitting on the street, spitting while you're talking, don't put the food on your plate back into the communal bowl, you finished, haven't finished everything, and farting. <laughs> When we think about like the role of civility, George Washington, as a founder of the country, really thought that we needed to think about civility as creating this new nation, and we needed these sort of rules of civility. So we can't take it to a higher plane. Calhoun mentions George Washington's rules about which we should, we should be doing in, in public. And as a matter of being respectful, considerate, and tolerant. But who would disagree with that? The question is, how do we implement this in policy? So I'm going to have to read this, but I'm going to take uh, a tack from what we call public sociology, where we think about the role of theory and making it something that is useful to people on an everyday basis. And we do this, in fact, in policy every day. Um, the theories that I'm going to put here are pretty esoteric theories, starting with Jürgen Habermas, you know, these German philosopher social thinkers. Um, but they've been really important for thinking through then how do we implement some of these debates in public policy? But the second important thing that I tell my students who are going to be, I'm trained to be citizens. This is one of the most important missions in teaching at the you know, School of Public Affairs is that you're not going to become PhDs in your political philosophy necessarily. But what you are going to be is a citizen. And there are policies out there that you're dealing with every day that are embedded with theory. So how do you understand what the assumptions are of those policies that are embedded in these theories? And so how do you read backwards into theory? So Habermas has an idea that we are engaged in a communication structure, what he calls the life world, our everyday life, our civic life. Um, and we debate policy in those life worlds at the kitchen table, elsewhere. But we, what we need to be is good listeners. And we need to think through what people are telling us and thinking about the embedded assumptions, fears, uh, concerns people have in this life world. So, fancy words, but um, what we need to do then in the public sphere is to amplify these debates. We can't have a democratic society without these debates. And so, how do we structure these debates? Well, then we have to sort of identify problems. The way we identify problems and frame them is an important component about how we deal with them. How we <coughs> name a problem is how we know it. So we're going to be engaged in thematizing some of these issues. You know, uh, what are family problems? What is you know handicapped accessible or not handicapped or you know you know independent living or not independent living? The way we name these things are important in theory, but then also in everyday world, he talks about ideal speech situations in the public sphere. It's a matter of recognition that people have unique experiences and we need to share them. But then we need to share them in particular kinds of mechanisms where people can actually hear them. And so we do. We structure these speech, speech situations. We have rules in the classroom for how we share ideas. It was interesting that um, I had a graduate student in my uh, classroom who said that in Turkey, people went around the room and they each took a turn to say something. Where he was in an American classroom and kids were just like shouting and trying to say, who's going to say their idea first? And you know, then you have these people who are not like the conversation. But we have these rules for speech. And then therefore, we have rules about the dialogue and how we experience other people's concerns. Um, when we, I went on the CCED 
planning um, committee for a little bit at the beginning last summer, um, as well we got bring up Norbert Elias. Norbert Elias wrote this important book called The History of Manners. And we're going to start with, a, you know, what's civility? Norbert Elias is probably the most important theorist about um, manners. And he was a German sociologist. He um, did two-volume work on the history of manners. It was a really interesting history. He was telling the story about how in medieval times we had all these sort of fighting units, these clansmen who would you know, go battling with each other. But when we were moving into a more modern state-making political structure, we had to get rid of all this violence. So how could we then socialize people into a civilized world? And so chivalry was invented. We're not going to go bash each other with you know, maces. <laughs> You know, we're going to instead show our refinement in eating with a fork and having you know, specific kinds of, of debates and creating sort of hierarchies and social statuses. This is really important for him, specifically in part because he then was trying to understand the ritualized ways we do debate. So he said in, in the United States and in Britain, we learned how to create parliamentary debate. Whereas in Germany, where his own was from the own culture, uh, he was noticing that people ritualized these kinds of competitions through things like dueling. And one famous sociology, Max Weber, had a dueling scar. And like he was going to do that in college. And he said, in fact, this would contribute to Nazism, this ritualized dueling. Why would we do this kind of socialization to create these kinds of manners, these formalized manners of violence? Um, he published his two volumes starting in 1939. His own mother died in Auschwitz. He was able to get exiled in Britain. So the idea of how we debate, how we ritualize interaction is really important. It could lead to a society that would allow Nazism to arise. Um, how would we civilize, but also decivilize through socialization, through social structure? So I just told this story, but he ends up with the term habitus. I think we've already talked about this in the last session, if you were here. Um, uh, one person mentioned that uh, Churchill had this idea that you know we um, build office spaces, and then those office spaces build us. This is the idea that Norbert Elias came up with in his term of habitus. He's not the only one to come up with this very same term, but he uses this term to say, we create our social worlds. We create rituals, we create institutions, and then those create us. So it's an interactive formalization of habit. Yes, we are engaged in habit, but it's a consciousness, it's an action, action it's an agency involved component where the world creates us and we create our own world. So what kind of world are we creating for ourselves? And I see this as a very optimistic social theory that if we don't like this world we've built for ourselves, we can build a new one. So we actually can engage in reform. Uh, there's a second theorist, Pierre Bourdieu, who was a generation later, who also came up with the term habitus. And this is the form, this concept of habitus is most used in academics these days, is Bourdieu's version. A structurationist argument, uh, where structured structures predispose to function as structured structures. I tell my students that when you take the social theory, it's a, it's a foreign language. It probably is a foreign language, it was written in French or English and then it's translated. But how do we read these difficult texts and how do we think about these terms? And so we have this shorthand, habitus. Once we have this picture of what habitus works like, we can use this shorthand term and we use these then as building blocks for more advanced theory and more for, um, for policy too. So I wanted to move into the idea of how everyday actions um, are engaged in everyday life. So I'm going to move into one particular example, which is the idea of quality of life and enforcing quality of life, enforcing that civility on our streets. And the most important example we have of this is from the Giuliani administration in New York City, where he imposed the Quality of Life Initiative, and he became mayor, to think about how to create more civil civility on the streets of New York. Um, so this is an article by Kathy Beckett and a graduate student for his name, Godot, who compared New York City's quality of life initiative and the city of New York versus Bogota, Colombia. Both places that had lots of crime, very serious crime in Bogota, with drug trade, et cetera. But they took very different components of thinking about how habit is in that quality of life and the enforcement of civility 
took very different turns. So back in Godo, I said this is not only important for thinking about you know, policing on our streets and how we interact with each other on our streets, but it's a really important component for how democracies work. When we look at how Bogota and New York work, um, how do we do it? So in the 1990s, city officials made a concerted effort to enhance security and stability. They both took the idea of um, have this as a starting point. They both were interested in quality of life. They had both um, read Broken Windows Theory by Kelling, uh, George Kelling, that said, it comes from another theorist, Emil Durkheim, who said, you know, when we are engaged in small uh, activities, um, the normative order is really important. How do we impose that normative order? How do we create an order, or, an order maintenance mechanism for creating civility, but for also creating, you know, everyday uh, belief structures, you know, religions, families, political structures, etc. From Durkheim, there came this idea of, that was applied by George Kelling and others that said, if there are small little incidents of incivility, if we take a broken window on a street, that can advance to wider concerns of crime or insecurities or fears. And so we need to take care of the small stuff so we can, don't have to worry about the big stuff. So the idea for the idea of broken windows, both you know, uh, political structures thought about this problem of minor offenses, how do you deal with minor offenses, and ended up taking very different turns in these two different cities. Um, so in the New York version, this is taken from the New York Times Magazine article by Trout, where he says we've got Giuliani internalized. We need to think about being afraid of all these small things. What if you see homeless on the street? What if you see people with, you know, blunt in their pocket? What if you are concerned with, you know, people who are engaged in graffiti? Giuliani said, we need to take the small stuff, take care of the small stuff, and we're going to take care of that with increased police presence, we're going to have increased arrests, and we're going to do stop and frisk because that will help stop violent crime. It was considered a fine example of um, broken windows theories applied because violent crime did fall in New York City. We all know New York City is a much safer place to walk, although criminologists are not so sure about the correlation as actually violent crime started falling in New York before Giuliani became mayor, um, which is one important piece. So here Giuliani's taking on the squeegee guy, the panhandlers. Um, but the point is that we internalize the sense of those people should be controlled. What it ended up with um, are some astounding statistics. And I didn't put them up on the on the support on the PowerPoint, but I'm just going to tell you that police funding increased from 1.7 billion to 3.1 billion between 1993 and 2001. So almost a doubling of police money for more cops on the street. Numbers of police officers on the street increased 12%. Yes, they got rid of homeless people, but they were essentially sent to Rikers Island. So the average population of mentally ill people in Rikers Island was 3,000 people on an average day with mental illness. Um, we know how Stop and Frisk ended. This article ended up was published in 2010, re relatively recent article in academics, but given the, the, uh, the, all the events of this past summer with Eric Gardner's death at the hands of the police and the debates we've had as a country, um, I think we're taking a strong critical look at what's going on in New York City and the idea of uh, community policing. How do we do community policing to enforce these small components of broken windows hypotheses? Or do we really think about community policing uh, options in a different way? In Bogota, for example, police presence went down. They did actually ask people to voluntarily, bear voluntarily, turn in their guns. 6,500 guns were turned in voluntarily. Then the police came in and said, well, we want more, and they seized 5,000 more guns. They clamped down on alcohol. They also put in curfews. Sounds a lot like Giuliani, too. But what they did elsewise is that they, they hired mines to come to do street traffic. They had a women's night out, so women could feel safe on the street. So they're taking on much more creative ways and uh, ignored my misdemeanors. You were allowed to have marijuana. You were allowed to have prostitution. You were allowed to have small uh, incivilities on the street. And focuses 
violent crime rate, rate also plunged. So the amazing thing about community policing applications, what we mean by community policing, is certainly not uh, the arrest rates going up twice as much under the kind of Giuliani uh, Bratton model of community policing. It was zero tolerance of policing. Can we instead think about problem-oriented policing, where we engage policing in much more socially responsible ways? Um, there's examples of it, where you have multiple agency response teams in Oakland, where you incorporate people who are specialists at homelessness, specialists in mental illness, working in tandem with police. Essentially changing the nature of policing from arrests to public servants. Um, police, uh, uh, Teams don't like this very much. They want to be there to protect and serve. But in, when you think about the average policeman's life, they're engaged more in domestic violence disputes than anything else. You have policemen in the home. They're the first order of responders to um, civil incidents, including social work. We have to think about policemen as being social workers. And this is a hard organizational change for policing. What do we mean by community policing? Are they members of the community and engaged in what they're doing? So there's other kinds of options thinking about this, uh, including some statistical pieces like Comstat, which are not so important for this, but not doing stop and frisk, but rather actually you know, taking someone's hand and taking them across the street, perhaps. There's new models for safe communities called the National Network for Safe Communities, um, involved in racial reconciliation, doing domestic violence intervention, engaged in social network analysis, enhancing legitimacy. So there is debate within police structures themselves to think about how do we apply these ideas of habits. Can there be different habits for police that are engaged? My last slide. So how do we regulate civility? That's really the issue. Do we do it personally? Um, but for the most part, we hire people to regulate civility for us so we don't have to. But the real question is then, how do we re Structure, structuring that structuration in our model of social regulation to enhance democracy, freedom, and uh, civility. And I think we'll take questions at the end because uh, yeah. ours overlaps so much. So I'll turn it over then to uh, Lisa. Okay. I'm technology challenged. I was sort of smirking when she was talking, we're not officially started, but I was living in New York City um, when Giuliani, yeah, I'm just going to try sitting here if that works, um, but I can move or I might stand up and move around. Anyways, I was living in New York City when Giuliani was in office and was uh, doing all that in the 90s, and it was really, um, from my perspective, quite sad, because really what his efforts were doing was um, just moving things out of sight of the people who complained, right? So it meant um, that the homeless people that I had become accustomed to seeing on my way to school or work um, no longer lived there. Uh, begs the question of who has the right to the city. So my name is Lisa Prahamus. I uh, teach at Grand Valley State University. I'm actually from upstate New York. Um, I've been in uh, Grand Rapids for the summer fourth year. I'm a sociologist of education, so I teach in the College of Education. I also, Grand Valley has started a new initiative focused specifically on civil discourse, so I'm the first um, professor of civil discourse there. Um, it will rotate every two years. Um, and whoever holds that post can choose basically the, the topic, or if, if, you know, for, to keep it simple, um, that you want to use to explore issues of civil discourse. And uh, the course that I developed was around Detroit. And uh, because when I moved here, I was really struck with, with this uh, West-East Michigan divide mm -hmm. and all of the preconceived notions people seem to have on both sides of the state. Um, so I'm going to switch gears just a tiny bit. Um, I don't have a, a ton of theories and things, but I'm happy to talk with you about that after if you want. Um, so my, I'm an ethnographer 
Um, I'm really interested in collecting people's life stories. And the work that I do in my research and in teaching is about understanding how each individual life story or life narrative is connected to society, larger social structures. So basically, how society is built is always connected to even our most intimate and isolated moments, right? We're all connected in that way. And uh, for me, at the heart of civil discourse is the understanding that each person has a need to be heard, um, which is really hard to keep in mind that what they're saying is preposterous right, in, in our minds. But um, each person has a need to be heard and to feel that they matter. And so I thought it might be helpful to use a definition of civil discourse, so I put it pretty simply listening and speaking in ways that purposefully honor each person's need to be understood <coughs> and respects multiple realities. Um, and I brought with me, you can look at them later, two books. Uh, one is called Dialogue and Deliberation, and another is called Turning to One Another. They're very uh, accessible, fairly non-academic kinds of books if you work in uh, organizations or uh, small groups. I know a lot of people who are using these books just to help the group process of trying to figure things out. But, so, well it didn't work. Okay, so, um, so we might know that it's important to, to listen to each other, right? So what makes it so hard? So one of the sticking points of uh, dialoguing is this tension between what we've lived, you know, we each have come into this room with uh, a lot of life stories. That comes into the door with us, right? So if we really get at it, say we wanted to talk about something, well, I'll pick something not controversial, like abortion. <laughs> um, we, we all come into this door with uh, certain ideas and life experiences that bring us to hold our ideas and our beliefs about that and makes it very difficult to um, be open to hearing that somebody else has a different set of ideas or beliefs, right? So there's this tension between what we've lived um, and uh, that's honoring us as individuals, and yet we have this need to be fair to the collective, uh, which would mean including all people's opinions and all voices. And I think civil discourse has a role in trying to breach this gap between individual interest and social responsibility. I like this quote, it's from one of the books, so I thought I'd throw it up there. We don't have to let go of what we believe, but we do need to be curious about what someone else believes. Something that my students taught me this term, was the first term that I taught in the fall, uh, the class in Detroit, um, was we sort of all collectively figured out with one another that no matter what somebody was saying in the room, this person has something to teach me. This person has something to teach me. Uh, so I have tried to practice that. It's really hard, but I think it's hard. So if we're talking about civility and civil discourse, I thought, wow, here's a conversation that we're having a really hard time with as a nation, right? But it's really important. So a lot of the work that I do is about how do we have these difficult conversations. I really like this photograph because my daughter took it. She's 18. She went off to college. This was her first uh, public protest march kind of event. And this is uh, Union Square. Um, I like it because it uh, has a child, uh, um, another population of people who are often not heard. Um, and so she's just starting to understand what it means to engage civilly and uh, about things that are brutally wrong and how, how do we do this in ways that uh, maintain human dignity and uh, find ways to do it civilly. And if there is a need, or I guess it begs the question, is there ever a role for uncivil discourse? We can challenge that later. Three um, questions that I find really helpful that I just want to share with you. Um, if you are having an easy conversation like about abortion, 
um, comes from the Public Conversation Project, and I have found that this has been really helpful in working with people when the topic is especially difficult. The first question, what is your personal history or experience with the topic? And with that, a group would be able to have quiet time to reflect and write and not necessarily have to share it immediately. Just have time to space to process that. And this is really like, oh, my grandmother, blah, 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 blah. You know, it doesn't have to be anything. It's just like, you have some kind of connection to this. What is that? The next question is, OK, well, what do you believe about this topic? What is really at the heart of it for you? What are you thinking about? Right? And then we process that. And we do do this in uh, scaffolding. And then the third one, do you have any mixed feelings about the topic, any gray areas? And most often there is at least one little gray area, and that's usually the space for dialogue to begin, which is really cool. So I really, um, I have found that these three questions work really well, and as I said, it came from the Public Conversation Project. Um, so this was my class going to Detroit. And I chose this slide um, sort of as a metaphor. This is the Packard plant. Some of my students in the class were from Detroit and sort of seeing their own city in different ways. And many of my students had never been to Detroit and pretty much um, had a lot of preconceived notions about um, what Detroit is as a place, as an urban space, and the people who live there. A lot of stereotypes and biases. Um, so the metaphor here is um, walking into the building um, and seeing what new things that you see. I, I'm old enough to meet these, so I need to figure out what I'm doing next year. So um, I think I don't have a slide after that. So can I go back? I want to keep that up. So this was the metaphor of how hard it can be to enter a dialogue, enter an uncomfortable conversation with somebody, and yet what is at stake? Oh, I know. I wanted to also share with you briefly. I'm going to read something to you is what I'm putting out. But when I had the um, slide up that said, um, police, put your clubs down. One of the reasons that I wanted to share that slide with you is because, uh, one, it's timely, but when I think about the practical applications of civil discourse and how important it is in everyday real life, right now my son is a sophomore in high school, and there's a huge debate happening in, in his school that erupted about a month ago when the student council decided that they wanted to print hoodies that said, all lives matter. And it really exploded because a lot of students said, you can't do that. You cannot change black lives matter to all lives matter. Don't you see what changes when you change the language? And uh, a lot of the students said, no, we have, we have students that are refugees coming from other countries. They have, uh, you know, histories of violence and things, and we don't want to say Black Lives Matter because then we're afraid that they're going to feel that their lives don't matter. So we want to say all lives matter. And they could not see eye to eye, right? And this is really the test of civil discourse. What was disappointing to me was that the school sort of was like, we were not touching so what, what do kids do, right? It, it's just all over Twitter and Facebook and just sort of exploded in social media. And I thought as an educator, this is an opportunity that the school should be grateful for, that these kids are really wanting to have this conversation and they don't know how. Um, so they have now gone to the administration and said, can we have some kind of mediated, facilitated conversation? about what this debate is, Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Um, so these are on the ground civil discourse kinds of situations um, in my head. But I wanted to share um, one last piece, I think, real quick, about how I think about civil discourse and how I have learned about it from my students. Behind people's adherence to particular opinions are their life narratives. This is at the heart of my teaching and research.
Words are often the visible, at the surface, representation of more deeply rooted life experiences that have left strong emotional imprints. My students have taught me this, and they continue to teach me about the power of personal narratives in shaping how people relate to one another. These are a few children whose stories I remember. In my first classroom experience, Ray Sean, a four-year-old boy, invited me to play in the dramatic play area where he proceeded to lay down on a small sofa and yell to me, and he stretched out like this and laid on the sofa. He yelled out to me gruffly, hey woman, give me a beer. <laughs> this is the same young boy who showed me how the dolls in the classroom could be physically intimate. Margarita screamed and physically clung to me when her grandmother came to pick her up. It was my job to reassure her as she left with her grandmother, even though I felt her fear in my gut. Kiana, also four years old, casually told me about the sex her mother and some man with a gun had the night before. And Hilario, an infant I met in a daycare program, could not tolerate any light and screamed incessantly due to the effect of his mother's crack cocaine use. These are some of the children I met while working in the field of early childhood education. Stories that stand out from my teaching at the college level include the young man whose parents sent him off to live with an uncle in another country in order to escape poverty and war. In a class discussion about sexuality and female identity, a woman shared her struggles with an eating disorder. Another woman had difficulty getting to class on time because her daughter suffered from clinical depression and she often couldn't get her bed out of bed in time for school. When talking about issues of poverty, a young man described his family's years of homelessness. Another man shared, his college advisor, shared that his college advisor suggested that he change majors to something more appropriate like physical education a simultaneous insult and per per perpetuation of a racist stereotype the young black men are natural athletes. These are the stories in our classrooms, and our classrooms must have space for their stories. I appreciate classroom environments that support and challenge each voice in the room, not because of some humanistic universal concept of equality and freedom, but because building coalitions for change must respect dialogue, multiplicity, and the experiential. If each of the students I described were to band together to advocate for some type of social change, they would be challenged to respect the particularities of their individual lives and their struggle to be effective. I imagine that the student who left his country to escape poverty and war would not readily understand the woman who struggles to eat as she recovers from her eating disorder. Kiana's memories of her mother having sex with the man with the gun may influence her initial re interactions with Rayshawn if he has not come to view women more respectfully. It is difficult to implement social change when people have differing views of what is right. And these views are shaped by very different cultural realities. To engage in civil discourse is, in part, to honor each other's life narratives while sorting through disagreements. It takes courage to re-examine one's own views and strength to keep listening when a person is saying things one finds intolerable or offensive. Staying at the table when conversations get contentious is hard work. But when folks do, transformative learning and living can happen individually and collectively. When we went to Detroit, a man came up, we told him what we were there for, and he said, I have a haiku for you. We said, okay. His name is Kamar L. Words are building blocks. They create, save, and destroy. What are yours used for? We had a uh, perspective from a broad view of how the bigger macro picture influences ability, and then at the individual level, what might happen. I hope that raised some questions in your mind or some ideas, any reactions?
Um, Somewhere in the midst, uh, we'll see you kind of throw a rhetorical question, you know, is there a, a time when we can be uncivil? And, um, you know, when you, when you look at the, uh, you know, was it Frederick Douglass who said power exceeds nothing without a demand, and, and the demand is, by definition, uncivil as opposed to a nice polite request, like, please give us our civil rights. And, and then when the power structures say no, and so, Dr. King and the others like nonviolent civil disobedience. Is, is that still civil? Um, like a civil disobedience of Simoran or you know required tactic to or, or yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean I'd, I'd like to hear what the everyone in the room thinks. I I think civil disobedience plays an important role in society and has throughout social change. You know, uh, I did a talk during like Martin Luther King commemoration week, you know, sort of thing, and we were sort of talking about this uh, commitment to nonviolent uh, social movement and social action, which I think is critical. Um, at the same time, if somebody is pointing a gun in my face, I'm not going to try to have a conversation and say, please don't shoot me, right? You know? um, I will try to be safe, right? That's a reality. But I will try to have conversations with as many people who are willing to engage in conversations with me and vice versa until hopefully that bullet cannot penetrate the amount of civil civility that's built or culture, uh, cultivated, I should say. Uh, I don't know, when I think of the bridge incident itself, yeah. and I think of you know, I think of um, Jews in ghettos during the Holocaust. You know, is there a point at which, you know, uncivil disobedience is called for? I've been doing a lot of work with the James and Grace Lee Fox Center in Detroit. And Grace Lee Fox talks about that, actually. Um, when, she, when she talks about the 1967 rebellion in Detroit and, you know, what is the difference between a rebellion and a revolution, right? Or even some, to, to ask some students to consider what is the difference between a riot and a rebellion, right? That's an important distinction in there. But she said, you know, we have worked so long for this moment, you know, all this important agitation and, and for this rebellion to happen, and, and we really felt it was important to erupt in the way that it did. But then we realized, now, right, we didn't think far enough ahead. Like, we didn't think what comes next. So she, she says the rebellion, in that sense, is historically important and is called for at times. But so is the idea of revolution. And what it means to be revolutionary means we move beyond rebellions to asking questions about what it means to be fully human and to honor and recognize each other's human dignity in that way, which is a much harder project. Right. I, I mean, I would fully admit you still got to have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you, you still got to have a plan for it. But at, some at the same time, it, it would, I don't know about doing nothing until you have a plan for sure, right? Mm -hmm. That seems counterproductive at moments also. You know, like that, that can keep you from doing anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I think. I think you're saying about having courage to re-examine um, the narrative. And I'm wondering, how do you come to courage? Is it a, a theory of practice that you gather people together? You have this magic thing that called that is called courage. How how does how do how do people gain that courage or understand that it is courage, it is a courageous act yeah. to re-examine? The way I've seen it happen has been in group settings. So it's been through human interaction and it's uh, it's really a matter of um, building trust with one another. It takes time to build 
uh, enough safety for somebody to be willing to be courageous, or Bell Hooks says to be publicly private, because that's really what it requires, right? Um, and when something, in my experience, when somebody brings something up and you have reached enough of that trust as a group, it triggers something, that emotional imprint that I was talking about before that brings us to our certain beliefs, it triggers something. And all it takes is the first person to say something. They share their story. And then the next person shares their story. And it's through sharing those personal narratives. That's courage. That's where I've seen courage. And that's where I've seen change. It's the only way I have ever seen one of the isms actually transform or shift in somebody is through that process of hearing each other's narratives, which is why I think it's so important. I don't know if that answers your question. Can I just jump, jump in? Because I, I, I comment, I have uh, some thoughts about all three of these comments. And I think this is why I think theory is useful. Um, because when we are thinking about our world, we don't often think about the structures that maintain power and privilege, especially the power and privilege that protects us. I had this experience when I was living in Los Angeles, in fact, just before the rebellion of 1992, and I was getting a tour of South Central by a guy who grew up in LA and was teaching at UCLA, and he was giving us a tour of the neighborhood. And a cop car, going down the street, and he goes, well, I'm going to go the opposite direction, because you know when the cops are here, you know trouble's going to start. Well, I was a white girl from the suburbs. I go, oh, but, but the police are there to protect us. And from his perspective, when cops are there, trouble starts. So you, you really have to shift your perspective and be in a place where you don't get that. Because I'm at a university that has primarily white, middle class, privileged kids from suburbs, and I teach Detroit, too. Um, and we talk about Detroit, it's really hard to shift their focus from thinking about the problems of Detroit to, it's not the problems of Detroit, it's the problems that, that the suburbs caused. To shift that power structure from, well, you know, like, I showed them this film about Detroit, and so one of the things that came up, it's so funny because the last hour, uh, the last discussion, was like, well, what about zoning? Like, they just, let's take zoning and that'll solve the problem. Let's like, just put this power structure on the space and it'll take care of all the problems. We just need order maintenance because of zoning. What will zoning do for you? But when you switch the discussion from, let's look at the history of Detroit and the people that left Detroit and took their resources with Detroit, by the end of the semester, I'm hoping they're gonna understand the problem of Detroit is not the problem of Detroit, it's the problem of the suburbs, where they're from. We read Tom Segrew's history. I said, well, what does it feel like when you read about this history of these parents, these grandparents, probably your grandparents? And I've taught many, many students whose parents had, you know, grandparents, grandparents had, had grown up in Detroit and left. I said, well, what does it mean to you when you read about their racism? Because you know, he talks about the walls and the, you know, the civic associations. I go, yeah, he's indicting your grandparents. And we had conversations like this. And then we look at a film from the 1990s about people leaving middle class suburbs in Chicago because black middle class people are moving in. And so they drove even farther out. I said, well, this is of your parents' generation. Have you talked about racism with your own parents? And they need some kind of scaffolding there to think about these power structures. And the theory, for me, is one way for students to get there. They're creating their own theories. They're borrowing from these theories. Like, yeah, we need more zoning. It's not going to be the solution here. We're building theory every day. We, that's how we make sense of the world. But then we also think about habitus. Okay, so you're part of this habitus. So we were in the last session, we were talking about you know, the problems of creative place making. But I am a member of a community that is doing a terrible job at creating place and civility in the Lansing area. Because I work at Michigan State University. And I think Michigan State University, who trains planners, is t doing terrible things to the city of Lansing. I'm happy to talk about that in another session. <laughs> but essentially, in my view, the, the state university turns its back on the city of East Lansing and has, creates a disconnect between East Lansing campus and the city and, and the city of Lansing. 
So the students are trying to say, you know, I never go into the city of Lyons. And, well, why is that? Well, I, you know, how do we create that? There is a habitus that we are engaged in every day in our own actions that are shaped through a power structure that you are performing every day. Unless they can understand that habitus of the disconnect between the campus and the city of Lansing. And how can we break that down? Um, they're searching for those things. We can talk about that. How are those built? How are those, you know, how are those habits built? And what keeps you from the city of Lansing? I think the key word there is built. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Oh, yes, and, we talk about that structure. And to go along with that, I think a critical part about civil discourse and that habitus and the theory and the structure is having an asset mindset instead of a deficit mindset. So that, um, yes, people have left Detroit and we have to understand that history. But we also have to look at people who are still there and living and thriving. And you mean not like slaves? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, there no, are thriving, a there. thriving communities of people doing really great things. So for my students, even like coming to know that is like, what? You know. But you know, these are all important ways we break down the barriers that keep us from bumping into each other. Any more? We really have uh, time. I'd like to thank our speakers again. <laughs> so now we go downstairs again to the rotunda. And the Fledge Youth Theater will be putting on.